Hi, everyone. Ed Lynch, Surfing Baseball. We promised to examine all the issues in the game, and we also promised very interesting guests. And I think my first guest is fits that bill. We pitched together 40 years ago, and uh, we've been good friends ever since. He's reached the top of his game as a professional athlete, as a professional broadcaster, my good friend, Ron Darling. So sit back and enjoy. Your bio, I, I thought you lived in Hawaii for a long, long time and then went to Massachusetts, but you left Hawaii. How old were you? I was only uh, three years old. Uh, in oh, fact, shit. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I went from Hawaii to living in uh, Millbury, Massachusetts, which is outside of Worcester. Uh, Worcester. If anyone knows where that is. Yeah, Central Mass, it's Worcester. That's right. And um, that is quite a culture shock, but I was only three. Um, so yeah. when you think about it, I really am a, 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 a mass hole, I guess, at heart. Um, that's what, that's, <laughs> no, what you are, you're the, only, you're the only Hawaiian born Connecticut Yankee that I know. <laughs> that's, right. Uh, that's right. Well, I'll tell you, first day of school at uh, Millsbury Elementary School, I bet you got called everything but Ron. <laughs> you, know, you know what? I've never been, no one's ever asked me that, Lynchy, and that's interesting. I, um, had a very interesting childhood, uh, uh, no one, I, I remember hearing words that uh, people wouldn't even hear today. Uh, uh, and I know you know these words, like half breed and words oh, like sure. that that I would get uh, all the time. So, um, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you tougher. And uh, That's right. a lot of uh, a lot of um, a lot of the toughness that I might have had as an athlete, certainly uh, that's part of it. No doubt. And you know what helps? I moved a lot as a kid. I didn't go through that. I mean, I was I went from one Lily White grammar school to the next Catholic Lily White school. But <laughs> what helps a lot is is if you're a good athlete, you know, you get accepted a lot quicker. And uh, all, automatically, you know, if you're on the baseball team, you got, you know, 15, 16, 17 high school friends or grammar school. You're on the basketball team. And, you know, and guys like yourself, I tell people this all the time. I said, who's the best athlete you ever played with? And, of course, it was straw. But yes. I always say the best pitcher athlete I ever played with was Ron Darling, and I believe well, that. How tall? How tall are you, Ronnie? I'm six four. Um, now that was a, a measurement about ten years ago. You and I, Lynch, we might be losing a half inch or two every <laughs> once in a while. But um, I, I, I will say that um, my thing really, um, the sports, hundred percent helped. Uh, where I found uh, a lot of pushback for me was. Um, you know, there weren't travel teams then. So I was really good at a young age. I remember my dad, uh, at, when I was seven years old, we used to play catch. And at seven years old in spring, uh, he and I went out to the ball field, uh, like in, you know, March, late March, whatever, in Massachusetts. We started throwing and he said, hey, let it go. And he couldn't catch me anymore. And, that's and I, remember that, I remember that was the day that he started making phone calls. And from that day forward, I never played for him, never was coached by him, and I always played up uh, to the point where, you know, I was playing Little League when I was seven. I was playing, um, I was playing American Legion ball uh, when I was 13 years old. So wow, when you're 13, that's, that's young. When you're playing uh, American Legion ball at 13 against 19-year-old guys, um, you know, you got to watch out. Those guys will uh, clean your clock. Absolutely. The reason I ask you well, how tall you are is at 6'4", you could play any sport. That's the great thing about being 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", you know. Um, <clears throat> you can play football, you can play basketball, you can play baseball, you can play hockey. I mean, that's that's a great height. I mean, you get up to my height, it gets a little more difficult, you know, to play football because I was so tall and skinny. So, well, the other thing you had going with you, and I saw this in New York, not only you're a great athlete, but you're a good-looking guy, so I'm sure all the, the chicks dug in in grammar school, I bet. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about grammar school. I think uh, when I when I think back on that time, and I was having a conversation uh, with my wife the other day about it, I remember, you know, it was kind of like the guy who already had muscles uh, the girls liked uh, because I was scrawny and and uh, get on that universal machine and and, universal. and I see guys get up. I see guys get uh, pull all the weight up, and I was barely uh, getting two plates up. Um, you know, I was uh, unusual looking, of course. And the guys who had the good hair, like guys like Dennis Eckersley, had to get girls. <laughs> the good hair, the good hair really helps. 
Oh, I know. Uh, I played with that. I steal half, most of my stuff I've stolen from him. And he said, you know, I got the good moss. I got the good That's moss. Right. He's got the greatest sayings in the world. He was a great teammate yeah. and a, a great Hall of Famer. Well, you, why? You, yeah, you why? Remember. Why? Go ahead. Well, first, let me give you the X story. You know, he has all these sayings, of course. He has his own language. It's very Absolutely. opaque. But if you know it, you can have some of the greatest conversations next to people who have no idea what you're talking about. But I remember when he said to me the first time when I was in Oakland, he said, uh, boy, a pair of shoes. And I was like, pair of shoes? What does that mean? Guy had just <laughs> struck out on three pitches, and he took the last one, didn't swing at it. I said, what does that mean, pair of shoes? He goes, a pair of shoes could have had the same result as the player up there swinging. <laughs> I, always thought that was, I always thought that was the greatest. Well, I was sitting in a dugout at Wrigley Field. I got traded over there. I didn't know anybody. And he's pitching. He's pitching yeah. against somebody like with stuff like mine. And he's out yeah. there, you know, he's dealing, as he would say. And, yeah. and somebody hits a home run. And so he's losing one nothing. He comes in the dugout in the sixth inning and says, hey, guys, this guy's tossing salad. Let's go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> tossing salad. I use that one oh, all the time. Man. Yeah. That's right. So um, you were I got to ask Yale. you. What, oh, yeah. Why, why Yale? You know, it was funny, Eddie. Um, I was trying to um, – that was the first time I kind of hedged my bets. And um, – you know, I was, um, I graduated early, went to college early, and I was about 5'11 at that point, maybe 155 pounds soaking wet. Now, all the things, uh, I was a good athlete, I could run, I could do a lot of things, but my size uh, was limited, and I just didn't think I was ready for, you know, the, the big time, whether it's, in those days, I think Arizona State, South Yo, Carolina, sure. where you went, Miami, yeah. those were the great baseball schools. And also a football player as well. So I went to Yale to hedge my bet. One, I'd be able to play football and baseball there. And two, that if it didn't work out and I didn't get a chance to really um, look at professional athletics, then I'd have the degree and I'd uh, go to law school or business school and be wearing a suit every day. Uh, yeah. The end result is I'm doing baseball broadcasting. I'm in a suit every day. So it's still fun. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I had to. I, I went through the same kind of culture shock you did, but in reverse. I, I was. I grew up in Westchester County, New York. Born in Brooklyn, I don't remember it. So I was kind of like yeah. you. I mean, you have barely any memories of Hawaii. I have barely any memories of Brooklyn. But you know, yeah. my dad worked for IBM, so we went up to Port Chester for six, Poughkeepsie for three, and then Mamaroneck for one. Then all of a sudden, he says, "Hey, uh, we're moving to Miami, Florida." So I mean. Here I am with the New York Brill Cream and talking like, you know, <laughs> you know, down in Miami, you know, in New York, we would go, you know, in the wintertime, we'd go to the pond and skate. And down in Miami, That's they're going right. deep sea fishing in the wintertime. So, yeah, it was you're culture shock. Like, uh, yeah, what's Spanish for forget about it, you know? <laughs> forget about it. Oh, that's, that's funny. Hey, uh. We all know it was a disappointing year for the Mets. All of us were very disappointed. I know they had injuries, you know, starting with uh, Edwin Diaz. I have seen more guys in my 40 years get hurt celebrating than almost <laughs> any other extracurricular activity, maybe a fight. But guys jumping up and down in a group like that. Look at Kendry Morales, somebody on the Twins, I yep, remember, missed a right. championship series. You know, I mean – that had to take some steam out of, of everybody right away. Yeah, Kendra Morales uh, hit that grand slam to win the game, right? And he stomped That's the right. and broke his, broke his ankle or his knee or something. That's right. Uh, yeah, That's right. It, it, definitely, it definitely took a lot of steam. You know, Edwin uh, was coming off, you could arguably say, one of the greatest reliever regular seasons of all time. I mean, There's you could no put doubt. him in the top ten. That's how good it was. Um, so it definitely – took a lot of steam out of them. But, you know, if you're a championship team, Absolutely. championship teams lose people all the time and you kind of figure it out. Um, you always have to remember this. I think if you're a fan or if you're watching baseball teams, because you know this better than anyone, because, you know, you were the head of a team. Good teams can have bad years. It can happen, and it happens all the time. And it's amazing to me because if you try to mathematically – chart it out and say, boy, we have 
strength at this position, strength at that position. We've got depth. We've got this. We've got that. It looks like a championship kind of year, and it ends up being that. I've seen yeah. more teams that are championship caliber that have bad years than the other way around. Yeah, you know, that's the old saying. That's why we play the games, you know. And That's right. You know, the easiest thing to do to get good headlines in December is spend a lot of money. What you're trying to do is get good headlines in September, you know, uh, and you're in a race. But, but you know, I, I was down. I went down to see Mex, or people don't know, Mex is Keith Hernandez. I went down to spring training. I was going to fantasy camp, and uh, and I was down there visiting family. And I was there when Verlander threw his last outing in spring training. I think he threw like six no-hit innings, and I'm thinking, wow, yeah. he's, he's going to be good. And then the next day, I guess he wakes up and has a problem. And then yeah. uh, Scherzer, Quintana, you know, it's hard It's hard to overcome that. You know, and going back to Edwin Diaz, people said, well, David Robertson stepped in. He did do a great job, didn't he, Ronnie? He did do a great job, but it wouldn't have been great if David Robertson was due in the seventh or the exactly. eighth. Exactly. You know, that's, that's he right. was in the ninth. Everyone had to move up a notch. And the next thing you know, the big and cru- crucial outs that you need in today's game anyway, in the fifth and sixth innings, were trying to be gotten uh, by younger pitchers who maybe didn't have the experience that a David Robertson had. So you had it set up in a way with um, uh, David Robertson to set up Edwin Diaz. Once Diaz was gone and Robertson was the main guy, you knew you were going to get excellence from Robertson. You just rather, um, you know, he be in a position to pitch some of those innings that that earlier in the game. Yeah, it's a domino effect. You know, you, you're yep. saying when you start over rolling people, you're putting them in a role above what their talent. Um, right. So, I mean, if you had Edwin Diaz with Robertson setting up, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah. You know, looking at the offense. <clears throat> You know, everybody looks at all these esoteric stats, you know, and, and for me, there's only one stat that matters offensively. How many runs do you score? You know, yeah. who, you know, that's what wins games. You score more that's runs right. than the other guy, right? So the Mets were it's, 20th it's... in runs scored, you know, and I'm looking about the major leagues. The major leagues now is just one league, you know, pretty much because everybody yeah. plays everybody. There's universal DH. So they were 20th in runs scored and, how did that happen? I mean, they they scored a lot of runs in 2022. Uh, guys get homer happy and strikeouts went up. Um, I, I don't know about that. I, I just think that, um, and you're so right, um, the whole game of baseball is, is runs scored for your offense and runs prevented by your defense, your pitching. Um, when you think of a hitter who's up there in a big situation, does he drive them in or doesn't he? When you That's have right. your good pitchers. You know, any pitcher, I care if it's Jacob DeGrom when he's healthy or Justin Verlander or Garrett Cole, you're going to have base runners. Now, you're going to have those games where you throw a two-hit piece, no one's really on base, and it's a walk in the park. That happens two or three times a year. So for the most part, you've got seven, eight base runners every game, and, the, and the, if you're going to have a good year, you've got to make sure you get those guys out. Second and third, two outs, the eighth place hitter is up. That guy has to be gotten out if you're going to have right. a good, good year. So that's, that's how right. it always always is. Now, talking about the Mets offense, I don't know that, you know, the balance uh, wasn't there. Because if you look at it, um, you can have teams that have amazing years where a guy like Pete Alonso hits 40 home runs. Uh, Francisco Lindor steals 25, hits over 25, drives in over 90. All of those things are all positives. But before, McNeil was on base at a 337 clip. That was his batting average. He was at a 270 clip. So those lack of base runners uh, is part of it. But I also thought, um, and, and there's no science behind this. I don't have any numbers to back this up. The game with one, in, in one instance, with a couple of decisions made on the rules, changed overnight and all of a sudden the teams that were very athletic and teams that could push the envelope and win on the margins meaning going from first to third stealing bases putting pressure on the offense on the defense those teams seemed to thrive with arizona of course being the one that benefited the most getting to the world series 
and the Mets seemed stuck in the mud. Um, I think it wasn't only the Mets. There were a lot of teams stuck in the mud last year, and you saw teams like Baltimore with all their great young athletes, uh, Philadelphia, uh, who have a lot of great athletes. Now, Atlanta's um, kind of, they have great athletes as well as sluggers. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that they didn't even make the World Series because yeah. that's one of the greatest offense I've seen since the 95 Cleveland Indians, uh, which yeah. was quite an amazing team. Yeah, you know, the rule changes, I was dead against a lot of these rule changes, but I finally realized you almost have to change the rules to protect the game from the way it's being played, like shifts. I was always like, forget yeah. shifts, you know, Let, let's not outlaw yeah. them. The guys are going to have to make an adjustment. Then I realized they're not going to make an adjustment. The hitters are <laughs> not going to make an adjustment. They're not going to bunt. They're not going to do those things. But I will say, there's the I call it the shot clock, the pitcher's clock, really, in my opinion, almost saved the game. I mean, the game yeah. was becoming absolutely unwatchable in 2022. I mean, the average time of game, you probably know better than I do, was probably about three hours, over three hours. And I think we're down to 239 or something like that. Yeah, the time of game is the same time of game that baseball had in 1984 when you wow. and I played, where um, wow. if we played two and a half hours, that was a long game. There, and there were many, many games where you'd have 205 and uh, go get a cold one. So, um, <laughs> yes, that rule, that rule really changed. I think some of the pitchers really changed with it. I think some of the pitchers uh, were not in the kind of physical shape to deal with, uh, with pitching that uh, rapidly. And uh, I think uh, it's changed the game in such a, an, an amazing way, to tell you the truth, because we, we need people to watch the game. And, um, you know, from a broadcasting situation, I would be done a game, Eddie. It would be three and a half, four hours. And I was pooped. I felt like Bruce Springsteen <laughs> after one of his concerts. And now I don't feel that way anymore. So uh, it definitely has taken a, a real step forward. Yeah, it, it really has made a difference. And, you know, the – the size of the bases, that inch and a half or two and a half inches makes a difference. Yeah. And so, like you said, the athletes, you know, uh, Ronald Acuna stealing 70 bases. I mean, we haven't seen right. that in a while. And I don't think uh, pitchers in our day, you know, you go into St. Louis and you've got those guys running. You go into Houston. I mean, if you're not paying attention <laughs> to runners, they're going to run you right out of the ballpark. <laughs> That's so I think right. it, over time, those kind of skills eroded. I know you were as good as anybody, and so yeah. was I on stolen bases for different reasons. Number one, you had yeah. a great move. I had a really good slide step. But yeah. nobody ever ran on me because they didn't have to. They just hit and run every pitch because they're going to make contact. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many well, times when I was pitching in St. Louis and I'm going, there he goes. I even went to Gary Carter. I said, hey, kid. If I hear there it goes, can I pitch out on a like if you call a slider and I hear can I pitch out? Will you be able to catch it? He goes, I don't know, let's try it. Shit, he almost killed. I almost killed the umpire. He said, No, Lynchy, we're not going to do that anymore. But you know, pit, catchers down on one knee and yeah, uh, pitchers not being used to holding runners. I mean, I think a lot of clubs are going to be focusing on that, focusing on adding more athletes, more speed. Everybody wants to get younger. You know, when fans used to say, hey, let's get younger, let's get younger, what they're saying is let's get younger with really good young players, you know. Yeah, right. Because those guys, right. they don't get hurt. Boy, what a difference when a guy goes first to third on a base hit or if a guy steals it, second. It, yeah, it, it, it's amazing. You know, the, the, the one thing I didn't realize is that generationally, if you take certain skills away from an athlete, they go away. For example, we've been for my last year in 1995, I was playing for Tony La Russa, and he was giving signs to the catcher to tell me when to throw over. I remember I had a discussion with him. I mean, no one knows when to throw over more than I do. And he said, listen, exactly. Ronnie, I, I, he goes, I really want to run the running game. I said, I, I, you're the manager. I'll do whatever, whatever you tell me to do. But so from 1995, to 2020 something pitchers have been given signs when to throw over when to step off when to hold all of those things so for those 30 years pitchers have lost the ability to hold runners on their own 
And I watched it last year, Eddie. You won't believe it. Guys leaving before they even a thought of throwing the pitch to the plate, and they w- didn't know what to do. They didn't know nice. if to step off. They didn't know the, the throw. It's just those skills have completely eroded. Hopefully they'll come back. I'm sure it's going to take some time. But uh, those are the little things in the game that are inherently um, were taught when you're a young player that just stick with you. But yeah. you can also eradicate that um, if you don't stick with it. That's right. I agree. And, and you know, we've also – raised any generational change it's usually like 25 reasons rather than one or two of course <clears throat> you're a young kid now you're an outstanding high school player you finish your baseball season what do you do you're off to showcase city you're going to aflac you're going to all these national showcases now you're up at bat your team is tied you're the home team it's bottom of the eighth there's a man on second with nobody out the last thing this kid's going to do in the aflac game at wrigley field is move that runner over with a weak ground ball to second base. He's trying to hit a ball, low, you know, out into the street. You know, pitchers right. are trying to strike everybody out. I think there's a little bit of a lack of playing the game as much as we played it. it you know, it's a game. You're trying to win the game, you know, and, and I think a little about a, a little bit of that is lost in translation. Well, think, think about this. Um, if you are trying to be a major league pitcher and you're 16 years old, you give two shits about getting people out. But if you throw 94 miles an hour at 16 years old, someone is going to give you 5 to $8 million to sign with their team. It doesn't matter if you can keep it within the cage. If you can throw <laughs> 94 miles an hour at 16 years old, you're going to get some money. And the same happens for the hitters. If you can barrel up, uh, hit with exit velocity, that is over 100 miles an hour, everyone's going to be drooling to sign you. Um, That's all well and good, but the art of um, pitching, um, think of it this way. When I was a kid, I'm a bad example because I didn't really pitch until I got to the pros, but the art of pitching when we pitched was you were chasing outs. How many outs can you get? And today if you're pitching, it's chasing velocity which That's has right. nothing to do with that. That's now, right. It, it can eventually, and they teach it on all different kinds of sports. If you're a basketball, if you're, sorry, if you're a golfer, they teach you to grip it and rip it and tee up that ball and hit it as far as you can, and then we're going to teach you how to get it in the fairway. The That's same right. is being done with pitching. You throw it as hard as you can, get your arm as strong as you can, and you'll get it up to 95 miles an hour, and then we'll get you within the strike zone, We'll teach you how to spin it a little bit, and we'll figure it out from there. So it's a whole different way of, of thinking about yeah. um, the same sport. It really is. And, you know, golf and baseball are so similar in the pitching part of it. You know, I mean, I used to go up to kids who were just grunting and throwing the ball as hard as they can. I said, you play golf? And they go, yeah. I said, how many guys that win long drive contests win tour events? You know, the yeah, answer is yeah. zero, you know. Right. I mean, do you want to go to the state fair and win a teddy bear the way you're throwing right now? I mean, <laughs> and, and when I when I was coming through, it was like pitch to contact, pitch to contact. The guy like uh, me had to pitch to contact. You were such a right. power pitcher. A lot of people don't realize, you know, when you came up, how hard you threw. And on today's gun, I guarantee you were getting close to the big three, 100. Because uh, I saw you yeah. on certain nights when you were, you know, in September of 83, we all go out there the first time a little bit afraid little scared yeah and you know dwight the hardest i've ever seen anybody throw a ball was when dwight his debut in houston and and That's right you know your debut i think might have been in philadelphia or somewhere like that and i remember you being out there blowing and and i tell this story <laughs> all the time you hit joe morgan right in the ass and he was pissed and he threw the bat down and he started walking at first. And it was like the comedian that goes behind a barrier on the stairs and can do like he's going down an escalator. You know, he looked like he was going down the freaking escalator and he was on the ground. Here comes a trainer. He, they, he had a, they had a, he had his arms over two trainers with his feet dragging. They dragged him off the field, but it's, it's amazing. You know, there aren't too it's many amazing. guys. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to, I was going to say, um, it's just amazing the hubris of youth that you think 
when you get on the field with some of these great players that it's like, I don't care who he is. I don't care if he's an MVP. I got to get him out. It's so strange that you have that much hubris that you think you can do that. My first start, the one you're talking about, was at the Big Shea, and it was against uh, the 1983 Phillies who went to the World Series. And Joe Morgan led off, Pete Rose hit second, and Mike Schmidt hit third. Those are the first three hitters I ever faced in the big leagues, and I didn't give it one thought. There was not one thought in my head before the game like, oh, my goodness, I'm facing these three guys. Not one. I was like, okay, well, you know, the next team will have three great players as well. But uh, there was no pitching that night on my part. I think I was just trying to throw the ball through um, <laughs> Junior Junior Ortiz, Junior Ortiz. Who was catching that day, and, Junior Ortiz. Um, and just throw it as hard as I could for as long as I could. Um, but uh, you know that's how first starts go. Um, but it wasn't uh, honestly. And you were talking about uh, pitching to contact. It wasn't until after about a year and a half or two years I found the beauty of the one pitch one out. Um, the nine oh, pitch man. inning. Uh, oh, once, boy. once that, once, once you find that that's as beautiful as striking out three on twenty seven pitches, uh, that's where you know you find you find your sweet spot. And when I found my sweet spot, then it became easier, not harder, to to get people out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you always said the uh, baseball, the pitcher's best friends, a double play. But really, is it's that first pitch out? You know, one pitch out. Yeah. Oh, you know, Seaver used to say. Tom Seaver used to tell us that all the time. Remember, Lynchy he said, oh, "Forget yeah. about that uh, first pitch strike, the first out of the inning." Because if you get that when you're in trouble, invariably there'll be two outs. And it wasn't really until because I led the league in walks in 1985. And Did I you really? I didn't know that. I, yeah. And the reason I, uh, I always say to people, the reason I did is because Dwight had his magical year. That was the only category left to lead in. So, um, <laughs> so I let him walk that year. But, um, and then, and then the next, so that year I walked 104 and 260 innings or something. And the next year I walked 50 something. Now, was it better control? No, it was a whole different mind thought. I was always taught you have to throw a first pitch strike. And I found myself, if I didn't throw that first pitch for a strike, that I would get, like, frustrated. Like, you know, I'm one pitching on a, uh, on a guy, and I'm frustrated already because it's ball one. I should not be feeling like this. So I, I maneuvered it, and I changed it to win the first three pitches. Somehow be one and two after the first three pitches. If you throw a ball on the first one, no big deal. You just got to win the next two. Once That's I right. did that, it took the defeatist attitude out of my game, uh, took the uh, frustration out of my game, and then it became much easier. No doubt. I mean, you, you ask any hitter what they're taught is get a good pitch to hit. And for pitchers, yeah. for me, is stay out of hitters' counts at all costs. I don't care if you're so Randy true. Johnson, Sandy Koufax, or Dwight Gooden. Well, maybe Dwight could get away with it, but <laughs> That's I, right. was not, I was not very good 2-0, 3-1. Oh, you know, it's only so no. many change-ups you can throw in a game like that. But Carlos Mendoza, why, mm. why Carlos Mendoza? I mean, you're in you're in the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in the world, and you're going to have unlimited resources, and you're looking for talented, experienced starting pitchers. I mean, you're looking for young players all the time. Why Carlos Mendoza? This is a very, it's an interesting question. You're asking why the Mets decided to go with an inexperienced manager in Carlos Mendoza. And they've done it a couple of times in their last uh, dozen years, right? They've done it with Mickey Calloway. Um, They also did it with uh, uh, Luis. I can't remember his last name right now. You'll you'll fill me in afterwards. But um, they've done it before. I think what happens um, with choices of manager is that who was your last manager has a lot to do with it. Almost like ex-wives. Okay, it's almost yeah, like, yeah. okay, who, who, <laughs> who, was, who was my ex-wife? Well, she was a, a beautiful lady. Uh, you know, we couldn't make it work. Uh, beautiful blonde-haired lady. 
I'll tell you right now, there's no way you married a blonde hair <laughs> neck tie. So I think I think what happened is that they had all this experience with with uh, Buck Showalter, one of the br- uh, brilliant minds of the game. I agree. And um, and I, I think in any organization you have you have what you deem your strength or weakness. And I think the Mets, you know, with um, an owner like Steve Cohen, um, no one in the game, maybe no one on the planet knows analytics as far as financial uh, issues are concerned more than Steve Cohen. Nobody. No doubt. No doubt. Um, nobody. So his strength of his organization is going to be the analytics part. So exactly. obviously Carlos Mendoza, who's done everything you can do in the game, been in the front office, he's been in the bullpen, he's been the first base, third base coach, been the bench coach. Uh, and being in New York, I think, helped him as well, uh, Lynchy. Um, yeah. Being a guy who spent his time with the, with the Yankees. So yeah, all, of, all of that helped. Now, that being said, I, I think at the end of the day, it's one of those things that will never change. Sometimes someone walks in the room, and wows you at hello, and uh, that's right. He must have t- he must have taken a meeting. You've done a thousand meetings with people that's looking right. for jobs, and that's occasionally right. someone walks in, and it, they, when they walk out, you go, "I don't know if we have a role for that guy, but we're going to hire him, and he's going to do something here." And that's I think right. that uh, that's kind of kind of what happens. And uh, um, hey, listen, at some point, Buck Showalter was 36 years old managing the Yankees. No one knew what was going to happen for him. Yeah, exactly. At one point, Tito Francona was managing the Phillies. You didn't realize that he was going to be a Hall of Famer. I was roommates with, uh, well, not roommates. I, I was locker mates with Bruce Bochy in AAA, and, and I loved him as a teammate. Well, did I think he was going to be a Hall of Fame manager someday? No, but he was. So yeah. um, you just... You just don't know when that's going to happen, and you don't know who that person is going to be. And I'm hoping I, I that agree. Carlos Carlos has an amazing career. So do I. And, you know, people don't realize this. Whitey Herzog's first manager's job was in the big leagues. Never managed anywhere right. before. So, I mean, there are exceptions to every rule. But, um, yeah, you know, we're all, we're all Met fans. You know, I grew up in New York. I pitched there longer than anywhere else. And... Uh, you know, I root for them, and I, I hope they do well. Yeah. And the one thing they've got, boy, that no, you can't just get is financial resources. Yeah, and it and it goes deeper than signing free agents. It goes to trades, uh, upgrading your minor leagues, upgrading your facilities, right. upgrading you know how the players eat, where they live in the minor leagues. I mean, you. you Resources in the minor right. leagues can right. really make a huge difference. I mean, you remember in the minor leagues, I lived in a house with like six guys. You know, guys are fighting over the couch so they don't have to sleep <laughs> on the floor. You know, and, and now was, Major League Baseball's taking over that function. Uh, it, it, is, it is amazing. I mean, you'll remember this, and, and people will find it funny. In spring training, it'd be a 95 degrees in Florida. We'd be sweating bullets. We'd come in, and they'd have soup. I mean... <laughs> It's soup. It'd be yeah, fuddled. hot soup. It'd be, it'd, it'd, be, it'd be fuddled me that this they ever thought that this was a good like thing to have was soup and crackers and all that kind of stuff. And it was just, it was bad. And, and I think more importantly, when you have pockets, you can eat bad contracts too, Eddie. That's a oh, really exactly. important thing because you're going to make mistakes. You can't be perfect every single time. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I remember when the Mets, and this is many moons ago, signed Jason Bay. I think one of the nicest people I've ever been around and a, and a great ball player. And coming off a season, I think, in Boston where he had 38 home runs over that um, that green monster, he signed with the Mets, and it was the first year they're in City Field, and it was about uh, 390 for the gaps. Um, and he came over, and he, it was an F7 summer for him. And yeah. he never really rebounded from that. So you just don't know. There's so many variables uh, to signing people. So when it doesn't work and you can flip the page and bring someone else in, that's strength of ownership. Yeah. And, you know, from the GM's perspective, I can tell you, when you're trying to trade Scherzer, Verlander, and you're asking people to take that contract and you want players back, 
that contract okay. Excel itself is more consideration than they're willing to, to give. So that's where the power of the dollar comes in, where he can say, OK, I'll pick up X amount of his contract, but I want talent back. And you, you basically in a trade like that, you're buying players from another organization based on how much of the contract you're going to pick up. So I'm excited about Listen, the future. Like you said, the good teams have bad years, but I'm excited about the future. You know, you you can't trade your draft picks, but that's what Steve Cohen and the Mets did. They did exactly. something that's that has rarely or never happened um, in that scope. They took a lot of their best players. They said, we are going to pay their contract, but we want your best young players. That's and right. owners, owners are always the same because they're like, <laughs> wait a minute. You're going to give me a player for free for a guy who hasn't proved anything? Yes, yes, yes. Let me take Verlander, and here you go. And Yeah, um, exactly. So when he did that, that's a that's kind of a um, – I wouldn't pretend to know enough about – of the hedge fund business, but you know, if you've made a huge uh, play in a certain uh, uh, part of of the real estate market or some kind of business, and it's not working out, well, you've already spent that money. How do I take that money and make it better someplace else? That's, That's right. Done all the time. That's right. That's right. Boy, I'd like to be a fly on the wall at the winners' meeting. The winner, me I mean, the owners' meetings, yes. uh, because that like, stuff like that's going to get their attention when you're talking dollars. You're certainly going to get their attention. But uh, anyway, Ronnie, thank you so much for your time. I hope to have you on in the future. I consider you a good friend. Um, and uh, congratulations on on your career. I mean, you're the hardest working man in show business. I hate to bother you with your time <laughs> off, but uh, thank no. you so much for being on. Lynch, uh, I, I am so lucky that I'm still uh, in baseball. Um, you and I have been friends forever. We always will be. And um, you call anytime and I'll be on the show with anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron.